It is impossible to believe in an ideal and still sufficiently love yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph Sulia, S-U-G-L-I-A. And tonight I will be holding a lecture on Gutzendämmerung, the Gutzendämmerung, or the Wie man mit dem Hammer philosophiert, by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated as Twilight of the Idols, or How to Philosophize with a Hammer, by Friedrich Nietzsche. And my name is Joseph Sulia, S U G L I A. Let me begin by expatiating on the title. So, Gutzen Demerung, Twilight of the Idols, recalls the fourth part of Richard Wagner's Ring Opera, which is entitled Goethe Demerung, Twilight of the Gods. And Twilight of the Gods concerns Ragnarok, which is the spectacular destruction of the world and the gods by submersion in water. However, Kutzendemrug, Twilight of the Idols, means something quite different. Nietzsche is here suggesting that there are no gods, but there certainly are idols. And all idols are anti-life. And all idols should be demolished. What is an idol? Well, an idol is the deification of nothingness. And Nietzsche proposes that we would be better off without any idols. We would do well to dispense with all idols, with all idolatry, with all idolization. So all idols deserve to be demolished. Why? Well, if you idolize an imaginary entity, you diminish yourself, you minimize yourself. You don't love yourself, as I said already. Anyone who believes in an ideal does not sufficiently love oneself. It is impossible to believe in an ideal and still sufficiently love yourself. That's the problem with an idol. Even to hold up rationality as an ideal and to call the human animal the rational animal is to disgrace the body. Moreover, it is to disgrace the totality of the human animal, the human beast. Now, all human beings have vital impulses, such as selfishness. And in traditional morality, the vital impulses, such as selfishness, are diabolized. And the anti-life impulses, such as asceticism, not aestheticism, but asceticism, and chastity, meekness, are angelized by classical morality and by classical religion. So what Nietzsche does first is to dispose, I'm sorry, to depose the angelized impulses, the impulses that are traditionally angelized, such as self-denial. Then he valorizes the demonized impulses, such as selfishness. Now the third stage of this process is to displace the differences between virtue and vice altogether. To rethink the entire axiology. Now there are no virtues and there are no vices. There certainly are values, however. Values exist to be sure. And each human being should invent one's own values. A common value a value held by all is no value. 
since value is based on rarity. A value is based on scarcity, not on commonness. That in a nutshell is Nietzsche's argument. Now the secondary title, how to philosophize with a hammer. No, how to philosophize with the hammer. Wie man mit dem Hammer philosophiert. What does this mean? Well, it has at least two connotations. The first is that Nietzsche intends in this book, as well as in most of his others, to shatter ideals. That's, that's really what he means by an idol. An idol is an ideal, right? To blow them up, to explode them into flinders. All of Nietzsche's late polemical writings have as their object the defamation of ideals and of idealization, the idolization of ideals. What is an ideal? Well, an ideal is a principle, it's an idea, it's a concept that is placed above humanity, such as the soul, such as gods, such as the beyond. And if you believe in ideals, this means that you believe in the ideal world, the epikina. And if you believe in the ideal world, this implies that you are defaming the this world, right? The world in which we are, the actual world, the only world there is. If you believe, for example, in the purity of ideality, then you are devaluing yourself. Again, as I've said, it is impossible to believe in an ideal and still love yourself. And what Nietzsche wants to do is to raise humanity, to elevate humanity to the status of gods. Be your own god. Be your own idol. Be your own hero. Instead of having heroes. Don't even have Nietzsche as a hero. No, I criticize Nietzsche all the time. He's my favorite writer, one of my favorite writers. I criticize him all the time. Don't have Zarathustra as your idol either. Zarathustra himself told us, if you want to follow me, betray me. Follow me, just to paraphrase, follow me with the piety of the traitor. By betraying me, you are following me. And if you betray me, this is the exact opposite of what Jesus said. If you betray me, then I will come back to you again. Every human being has the desire to become God and all idols deserve to be slaughtered. Not literally, not literally, of course, according to Nietzsche. So Nietzsche's philosophizing is the hammering of ideals. That's what he means by twilight of the idols, twilight of the idols. The destruction of all ideals, or every ideal posits a transcendence, a beyond, a world that is higher than the world in which we are living right now. So ideals are a slander to life. They are hostile to life. Every ideal humiliates humankind. Every ideal humiliates humanity, lessens humanity, degrades humanity, humankind, which means that ideals narrow human possibilities. So that is the first connotation of philosophizing with a hammer. Wie man mit dem Hammer philosophiert. The second connotation is, well, this is likely, the second connotation that is likely intended is that of the reflex hammer. And Nietzsche does write about this a bit. This book was published in 1888. And guess what else was released in 1888? Well, in America, in the United States of America, something was invented. The tomahawk reflex hammer, also known as the Taylor hammer or the Taylor reflex hammer. This was developed by John Madison Taylor in 1888 in the United States of America 
in the same year in which this book was composed and published. Now, perhaps Nietzsche was unaware of this development, but he did read newspapers, albeit with a thick mixture of contempt and disgust. And this was the first reflex hammer to be invented. The second connotation then is that Nietzschean philosophy tests the soundness and the healthiness of ideals. When I say healthiness, I mean, to what extent, to what degree does this ideal enhance life? How does it support life? Does it support life? Does it intensify one's feeling of life? Or does it not? Well, Nietzsche tells us in the preface to this book that when he tests the, the soundness of these ideals that he's going to be writing about in this book, he always reveals these ideals to be hollow, hollow, right? Hollow, H-O-L-L-O-W, not H-A-L-L-O-W. Although these ideals are hollowed with an A, they are hollow with an O after Nietzsche tests them, sounds them with his hammer. Nietzsche never actually writes, what does not kill me makes me stronger. This is the most famous statement to come out of this book. But that's not what Nietzsche actually writes, nor does he write, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. This statement, again, is one of the most famous statements that have ever been attributed to Nietzsche, that have ever been attributed to Nietzsche. And one can find it in music, in the music of Kanye West. One can find it all over myspace.com and other social media applications and websites. But the original statement is aphorism number eight, and it occurs in the first section of the book after the preface entitled Epigrams and Arrows, Sprüche und Pfeile. However, again, Nietzsche does not actually write, what does not kill me makes me stronger. This is one of the most miscited passages in the history of philosophy. So what does Nietzsche actually write? Well, this is what he writes. Quote, from life's school of war, what does not kill me makes me stronger. Aus der Kriegsschule des Lebens, was mich nicht umbringt, macht mich stärker. What does Nietzsche mean by this precisely? Well, let's talk about it in just a moment. This is a lesson learned in life's school of war, right? Let's break this statement apart. So Nietzsche writes, what does not kill me? Let's pause over that. What does not kill me? When Nietzsche writes, what does not kill me? He is referring to the crisis of deep suffering. The crisis of deep suffering could be the loss of a parent, the loss of a child, the loss of one's property, the loss of a spouse, any gnawing, debilitating illness, abuse, violence. All of these things are examples of a profound crisis and the crises of deep suffering. Fine, so what does Nietzsche mean by me, by the first me? What does not kill me? Who am I? I am anyone. Anyone who is not yet distinguished. Anyone who is not yet distinctive. Anyone who is not yet differentiated. Anyone who is still immature and not yet forename. Now, I can't go into this now, but if you're interested in what I mean by forename, you should listen to my 15-part video series on Beyond Good and Evil, Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future. But at this stage, what does not kill me? 
I am mobbish. I'm a member of the mob. I'm a member of the crowd. The canai. I'm a member of the canai. The mob. The crowd. What then does Nietzsche mean by makes me stronger? He means this. What does not kill me makes me distinguished. What does not kill me makes me distinctive. What does not kill me makes me elegant, dignified, forename. Deep crisis confers upon me the right to separateness, the ability to experience long periods of solitude. Deep suffering makes me capable of living separately from other human beings. It also makes me more profound. What does not kill me makes me deeper. The crisis of deep suffering transforms me into the free spirit, the Freigeist. What does not kill me kills me. Deep suffering makes me deeper. Deep suffering makes me profound. But who are we? Who am I? We are the free spirits. And what exactly transforms us into free spirits? The crisis of deep suffering. The crisis of profound pain. To put it another way, I know that pain and suffering are not the same. What distinguishes pain from suffering is time, right? Pain is short, suffering is long. Put it another way. Deep trauma gives birth to the sovereign individual. It is not just that the trauma allows us to grow. No, I mean, that's a cliche. It's a cliche. No, it is that trauma is necessary for growth. Trauma is necessary for growth into the sovereign individual. What does not kill me, the crisis of deep suffering, transforms me into the free spirit. Now, who is the free spirit? What does this term mean? Nietzsche uses it from the beginning of his period of maturity until the end of his period of intellectual maturity. Who is the free spirit now? The free spirit is negatively one, to, one who does not think according to an ideology. One who does not think according to a party. One who does not think according to a program. One who does not think according to a dogma, according to a policy. The free spirit is capable of thinking for oneself and is capable of thinking two or more thoughts at once, both pro and contra, both yes and no, simultaneously. So another word for the free spirit is, to use an old word, libertist, libertist, antinomian is another word. A free spirit is opposed to all idols, to all traditions, and destroys ideals in order to clear a space for one's own freedom. In particular, the freedom of thought. The freedom of thought. So the free spirit, or if you would, the libertist, the antinomian, makes trauma the organ, the organ, excuse me, let me say that again. The free spirit, the libertist, the antinomian, makes trauma the organ, the function of one's own power. So the free spirit converts trauma into strength. The free spirit transforms trauma into an appendage of one's own will to power. Now we should discuss the will to power. What is the will to power? What does that mean? What is the will to power? 
The will to power means that the whole of life, all of life, is a perpetual sequence of power struggles. And that every living entity seeks to exert power over all other living entities. Life is violence, but not violence in the literal sense. I mean, think of nature and the struggle between the eater and the eaten. Life is not violence in any literal sense, but it's, it's only violence in the sense that every living organism seeks to overthrow obstacles that impede its growth and wants to escalate its degree of power. I think that's what Nietzsche means. And this is a particularly Nietzschean idea. We could even see this in English, in the English language, the idea that life is violence. The Latin word for life is vit right? That's the Latin root, vit. But vit, V-I-T, is also the basis for the word violence. So the word for life in Latin, vit, is the same word that is contained in the word violence. This is not the case in German, but it's interesting and relevant, I think. Now, if you've listened to my videos on on the genealogy of morals, especially the second and the third video in the series, you will know all about resentment. Resentment is not resentment or resentfulness, but if you haven't read on the genealogy of morals, Zur Genealogie der Moral, or if you haven't watched my videos on, on the genealogy of morals, please do so. Please do so at this point, because otherwise this, this is not going to make any sense. But what is resentment, and how is it relevant to what we're talking about? Resentment is inimical to life. It is an anti-life position. Um, resentment is what Nietzsche calls in on the genealogy of morality, zur genealogie der moral, misarchism, misarchism because it denies that all organisms seek mastery, seek domination, sovereignty over all other organisms. So misarchism holds that all government, all administration is evil, but it is a necessary evil. So what is the difference then between misarchism and anarchism? Well, I'll tell you. Anarchism doesn't think that government is a necessary evil. No, anarchism believes that all government should be annihilated. Anyway, according to Nietzsche, life by its very essence is hierarchical, dissymmetrical, and let us not be ungrateful toward those who have power, he is suggesting, for they impel us to take power away from them. Nietzsche is not a conservative. He's not a conservative. And I've noticed that, and this has given me some satisfaction, that liberals, I'm a liberal myself, a libertist and a liberal, um, have been claiming Nietzsche. Right? So Nietzsche doesn't belong to the conservatives. He belongs to the, to the liberals. Anyway, so Nietzsche is affirming power. No, I, well, he's, he is affirming power, but... Nietzsche is affirming life as the power will from an extra moral perspective, right? Beyond good and evil, without the interference of moral judgments or moral evaluation. Now, some assume that Nietzsche must be a fascist because he developed the theory of the will to power. Well, Nietzsche, as I've said in other videos, Nietzsche bases the will to power doctrine on Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer wrote about the will, but what Schopenhauer meant by the will was a kind of metaphysical force of nature. What Schopenhauer meant by the will was the will to life. And Nietzsche transforms that, modifies it, modulates that into the will to power. The point of life is not to promote life. That's Schopenhauer. The point of life is to promote power. 
But this does not make Nietzsche a fascist, far from it, far from it. Those who believe that have no understanding of what fascism means and they've never read Nietzsche at all. They certainly have never read Nietzsche with understanding. Um, Nietzsche was a lifelong anti-nationalist and vituperates endlessly against anti-Judaism or what he calls anti-Semitism. Nietzsche was a friend of the Jews. He loved the Jewish people, he even loved the Hebraic Bible, which of course is a central text of Judaism. So let no one therefore mistype Nietzsche as a fascist or a proto-fascist. Nietzsche was an enemy of, if not fascism, then at least many of the lineaments of what would become to known of what would come to be known as fascism in quotation marks. So Nietzsche though was not a misarchist, certainly not. And he wasn't an anarchist for he thought that hierarchies do exist. They do exist in life, in nature. He had a certain sympathy for the idea of aristocracy, it is true, but he was not a proto-fascist, not at all, anyway. So to get back to the main point, what affects me calamitously, what affects me catastrophically, paradoxically intensifies my personal power. This is what Nietzsche means when he writes in this book, from life's school of war, what does not kill me makes me stronger. Let me pause for just a moment. So now I really want to get into the meat of this text. Like, what is this text about? What is it about? Uh, what, are the, what are the idols that are twilight in this book? What are the ideals that are annihilated, that are shattered? Well, the first idol that Nietzsche smashes is the problem of Socrates. That's the title of, of the first chapter after the aphorisms, after the, at first there is the preface, then there, then there are the aphorisms. Now we're going into the essays or the chapters, the chapters proper. What is the problem of Socrates? Well, the problem of Socrates is the following problematical equation. Reason equals virtue equals happiness or fortune, if you want to translate it into. Vernunft ist gleich Tugend ist gleich Glück. Now that comes from Socrates. We learn from Socrates, particularly in the Charmides, if you've ever read that under, underestimated dialogue. It's worth reading, to be sure. That the wise person is the one who restrains one's desires. And the wise person is the happiest person because the one who restrains one's desires is the happiest person. Now, I know there are profound differences between Plato and Aristotle, to be sure, but this is a coincidence between like a concordance, um, a continuity, a consonance between Plato and Aristotle, I think. Because the restriction of the impulses, of the desires, of the inclinations, of the appetites, of the proclivities, of the predilections is called sophrosyne. And this is linked to human flourishing, or what Aristotle calls oidaemonia. Nietzsche never actually uses the term sophrosyne in the text, but he is clearly thinking of it. He's clearly thinking of it. Sophrosyne does, does uh, appear in the Charmides of Plato. The Socratic problem then is that the restriction of the desires leads to virtue, to virtuousness, or to the virtuous character. And the virtuous character leads to human flourishing or oidaemonia. Now, there are massive problems with this Socratic equation. 
The first, and the one on which Nietzsche fixes his attention, is that restraining one's impulses will lead to happiness. No, it will not, Nietzsche says in so many words. No, it will not. It's not true. Nietzsche writes, when people need reason to act as a tyrant, which was the case with Socrates, the danger cannot be small that something else might start acting as a tyrant. Now, let me read this. This is on page 72 of the German. This is paragraph 10 of the problem of Socrates, das Problem des Socrates. Wenn man nötig hat, aus der Vernunft einen Tyrannen zu machen, wie Socrates es tat, so muss die Gefahr nicht klein sein, dass etwas anderes den Puranen macht. What might that something else be? Like, what might the something else be that might start acting like a tyrant? Well, Nietzsche does not give us a direct answer to this question, but I think that I know. Restraining the desires by reason will lead to the recrudescence, to the resurgence of those same desires in their fullest force. The more you try to repress your desires, the more your desires will surge upward. This is what Freud calls the return of the repressed. Die Wiederkehr des Verdrängten, right? So, and, and we know very well that um, not only did Freud read Nietzsche, obviously he did, but Freud really based his own psychoanalysis on Nietzsche. There would be no psychoanalysis, in other words, there would be no modern psychology were it, were not, were it not for Nietzsche. So modern psychology commits parasite against Nietzsche, but you can't, you can't get away from Nietzsche. All modern thought, all roads in modern thought lead to Nietzsche. Nietzsche is unavoidable. You avoid him at your own peril. And scholars, writers, thinkers who avoid Nietzsche or who discredit Nietzsche, like Steven Pinker, will inevitably repeat Nietzsche. That's the return of the re that's the return of the repressed right there. <laughs> it's a kind of intellectual return of the repressed. Well, anyway. Repression. Let's talk about repression. Repression is one attempt to manage the unruliness, the untrammeledness of the riot of the emotions and the other feelings and moods. But there is another form of self-maintenance, and that is the justification of the feelings and the moods. There's something that one could call um, rational love or rationalized love. What is rationalized love? Well, that's, it's certainly, I'll say what it's not. It's not instinctual love. Think of a woman who tries to find a man attractive, even though she has no genuine passion for him. Well, she rationalizes her desire for the man. That is to say, she gives herself reasons to desire him. It's not a good idea. This sort of thing seldom works. Rational desire is not authentic desire at all. Now, it might happen that over time, one could find someone attractive whom one initially did not find attractive, of course. I'm sure that it happens all the time, not to sound like the Beatles, but um, rational love is not genuine love. Happiness really comes from the release of the instincts, the liberation of the desires, the affects, the feelings, the instincts, not from the repression, not from the repression of the desires, the affects, the feelings, the instincts. I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to say something in German. Die Moral ist die Qual. Die Moral ist die Qual. Morality is torment. That is to say, the inhibition of the inclinations is a kind of torment. To be sure, every, every child knows this. But let no one suppose that Nietzsche is a hedonist or an oidemonist, a sybarite, 
Sybarite, if that's how you pronounce it, a hedonist. No, not at all, not at all. He's not. He's not. In the section of the book entitled Morality as Anti-Nature, Moralität als Widernatur, Nietzsche makes it quite clear that he is not endorsing the running wild of the desires, the running amok of the desires, the running riot of the desires. Not at all, not at all. The passions, Nietzsche argues, ought to be intellectualized, cosmeticized, sublimated. He doesn't use those words in, in, in their German equivalents, but that's what he means. I'll quote him in a minute. And the name of this intellectualization, cosmeticization, sublimation of the passions is love. Nietzsche writes, I'll, I'll quote him in English and then in German, the intellectualization of sensuality is called love in italics. It represents a great triumph over Christianity. Die Vergeisterung der Sinnlichkeit heißt Liebe. Sie ist ein großer Triumph über Christentum. Well, first of all, let me say that this is reminiscent of something that Nietzsche writes in Beyond Good and Evil, Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future. Jenseits von Gut und Böse, Vorspiel, eine Philosophie der Zukunft. In English, uh, this is what Nietzsche writes in Beyond Good and Evil. What is done out of love always occurs beyond good and evil. It's a very famous statement. Was aus Liebe getan wird, geschieht immer jenseits von Gut und Böse. Now, the meaning of these two statements is essentially the same. Classical morality separates two different kinds of romantic love, right? The first kind of romantic love is the pure kind, the holy kind, the sacred kind, right? And the second is what is sometimes called concupiscence, that is to say carnal love or lust. So classical religious morality separates love, parses out love, parcels out love into two types. Now, classical morality condemns carnal love. It seeks to extirpate desires that are inextirpable. Morality is inimical to the impulses. It rebels against the life. It revolts against the impulses of life. Now, Nietzsche, by contrast, is affirmative of the impulses of life, but he is not a carnalist either, no. He doesn't believe in a rigid distinction between pure love and carnal love. And he writes this also in, in the book that he wrote a year before this one on the genealogy of morality. In essay three, if you want to hear me lecture about essay three, I created a video on that and I talk about this a bit. The false, I mean, Wagner. Anyway, you, you, can, you can either read essay three of on the genealogy of morals and you can you can read all about that or listen to my video if you want this is a false antinomy according to nietzsche you know this false distinction and he does not explicitly write this in the passage that i'm citing but the antithesis between pure love in quotes and fleshly passion is a false distinction so what nietzsche names the intellectualization of sensuality is the supersession of the false dualism between the so-called spiritual love and the so-called carnal love. I believe that this is the main point which Nietzsche is making, even though he does not make this point explicit. So what is Nietzschean love? What is love in the Nietzschean sense? Well, love exists, just to paraphrase, love exists Nietzschean love exists beyond conventional morality because, I mean, he's already told us this. I don't want to just repeat the quote, but why, why, why? Why? Because it is the synthesis of the pure and the crude. It is the marriage of the dove and the pig. These are, these are Nietzschean metaphors, the dove and the pig. 
Nietzschean love, again, is the synthesis. It is the marriage of the crude and the pure, the dove and the pig, right? Love is spiritual and physical for Nietzsche at the same time. That's all I mean. That's all he means. Happiness comes from the feeling of the enhancement, the intensification of one's own vitality, or at least one's sense of one's own vitality. But this is not some kind of do whatever you want, let chaos reign, all hail disorder. It is not some kind of unconstrained scruffiness, right? some kind of laissez aller, right? Let it all hang out. No. Nietzsche teaches this in a different book, but one that was written in the same year as this book was written. It's called The Anti Christian. Uh, let me actually quote this. So this is Nietzsche on happiness. What is happiness? Let me read this. What is happiness? Here it is. What is happiness? The feeling that power is growing, that some resistance has been overcome. And in the German, here it is in the German. Give me a moment, please. Was ist Glück? Das Gefühl davon, dass die Macht wächst, dass ein Widerstand überwunden wird. Right? So according to Nietzsche, Socrates had a pathological obsession with reason. Socratic philosophy is the pathology of rationality. According to Nietzsche, not me, just according to Nietzsche. Nietzschean thought, by contrast, is not a rationalism. It is an agonistics and an erotics at the same time. Let me pause. So that was the first idol that was smashed, but there's a second idol too. There are many idols here that he smashes to pieces. The second ideal that Nietzsche explodes is the ideal of the absolute, right? Absolute being. For example, permanency, right? The idea that things last forever without conditions, without relativities. The permanency of absolute presence. The idea of a permanent being behind the whirlwind of the senses. Now this permanent being being might be the stability of the I, right? The self, the unchanging center of the self of consciousness. It might be the eidos of Plato, which would exist in some spaceless space in some timeless time. It might be the idea of a signified meaning that would exist behind words, behind language. But meaning does not exist behind words. It is generated by the interrelatedness between words. It, 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 meaning is generated from the interwebbing of words. Be, it's generated by the relations among words and among words, not just words, but among letters and among syllables, right? Permit me to quote Shakespeare, because I think this is interesting. I've been reading Henry the Fourth. And in Henry IV, part one, these lines are spoken by Falstaff. What is honor? A word. What is in that word, honor? What is that honor? Air. A trim reckoning. A trim reckoning. What Falstaff says about the word honor may be fairly said about all words, all signifiers. What is a man? If someone asked me that, I would have to reply, a man is a word. First of all, it's a word. What is within that word? Air. <laughs> so the subject, I, um, is a grammatical superstition. And our concept of the self as an unchangeable and unageable center of consciousness comes from a prejudice of Western grammar. 
because so many of our sentences begin with a subject, right? So many of our sentences begin with the word I or some other subject. We assume unconsciously at least that every action has an agent. We talked about this when we discussed on the genealogy of morals. So as Nietzsche writes in this book famously, I am afraid that we have not gotten rid of God because we still have faith in grammar. Ich fürchte, wir werden Gott nicht los, weil wir noch an die Grammatik glauben. It is quite rare for a philosopher to write about the body, isn't it? Um, Schopenhauer was one of the first German philosophers to take the body seriously in a positive manner. In fact, he was one of the one of the first philosophers to core to take the body seriously. Schopenhauer also, perhaps not coincidentally, took animals seriously. Schopenhauer took animals much more seriously than any other philosophy before him. I think. I think. I might be wrong, but I haven't come across any other philosopher before Schopenhauer who took the body as seriously as Schopenhauer did, nor nor a philosopher who took animals seriously as, as Schopenhauer did. But anyway, I don't want to divigate. Uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, fascinatingly, writes about the nose. He writes about the nose, the nose which can detect motion. Now, I don't know if this is true, but I know that Nietzsche thinks that the nose can distinguish subtleties that a spectroscope would miss. Now here, Nietzsche actually writes something similar to that, um, but I'm alluding to a song actually by Brian Eno. It's an intentional allusion to a song by Brian Eno. I'll let you find it, but Nietzsche inspired many musicians, right? He also, I mean, including Marilyn Manson, um, I was rereading the anti-Christian and I noticed many, many correspondences between Marilyn Manson's lyrics and Nietzsche's book, The Anti-Christian. Anyway, now I'm not sure if the nose can detect motion. Uh, I'm not a medical doctor, but I know one thing. I know two things about the olfactory apparatus. Um, I know that the olfactory sense plays a role in hearing and in gustation, which is the sense of taste, the sensation of taste. Now Nietzsche writes about the nose in order to highlight his argument that the so-called world of appearances, the world of phenomenality, right, is the so-called true world. It's a, there's a false distinction between the so-called true world and the world of appearances. The true world is the world of appearances. The world of appearances is the true world. Our senses do not lie, as Plato believed, as many, many philosophers, many writers thought, and still think. The sensorium gives us the only information that we can have about the world, sensory information, sense data. All of this is to highlight the argument that the nose and the other sense organs bring us into closer contact with reality than do mathematics and logic. And I know this might be another Nietzschean contradiction. As I've written in other essays, Nietzsche does contradict himself. And I think this is, it's an apparent contradiction in this book. Nietzsche bashes logic, but then he, later on in this same book, he talks about how the Germans have lost their knowledge of logic and they need to reclaim their knowledge of logic, 19th century Germans, late 19th century Germans. So I've already talked about this in my, in my lecture series on Beyond Good and Evil, but for Nietzsche, there is no logos behind the maelstrom of appearances. There is no perusia. There is no permanence of absolute presence. Everything is motion. Everything is motion without fixity. And um, this is why Nietzsche makes a concession to Heraclitus. Nietzsche makes room for Heraclitus. He writes approvingly of Heraclitus. Because Heraclitus believed that everything is change without stasis. 
Neither is there the absolute origin or the absolute finality. I say the because it really doesn't make much sense, does it, to say an absolute origin because absolute means without uh, relations, without exceptions, without conditions. Anyway, I'm sorry. Um, what seems to be a terminal point, what seems to be a terminal point is nothing but a node in a web. There are no absolute beginnings or absolute endings. There is only becoming without being. If by being one means the stasis of presence. Another way of saying this is that the distinction between being and nothingness is a false distinction. There is only becoming, not being. Not being understood as, as stasis. So appearances, what appears to our senses, are not errors, no. The dichotomy between the so-called true world and the so-called world of appearances is a false dichotomy. There is only one world, and that is the world of the senses. This is why Nietzsche writes, in italics, we got rid of the illusory world along with the true one. Mit der Wahrenwelt haben wir auch die scheinbare abgeschafft. The true world is a fiction. The true world is a fiction. And I know I've been criticized for using this word fiction. I don't know why, but I have. I know what I mean. I know what I'm talking. I, when I use the word fiction, I mean the word fiction in the sense of something that has been fabricated, something that has been made. That's all I mean. I don't know why I've been criticized for using that word, but anyway. The importance of art comes into play here, right? Because art reminds us that phenomena are all that we have, right? Art reminds us that all we have are appearances. Art repeats the world of appearances. Art highlights the world of appearances. Art underlines, underlines, emphasizes, accentuates the world of appearances. Art highlights phenomenality. Works of art illuminate the fact in quotation marks that there is only one world, the only demonstrable, probative, provable world, the only livable world is, again, the phenomenal world for Nietzsche. That's what he means. Now, the third idol that is twilight in this book, if I may put it that way, is imaginary causation. This is really interesting. I hope that you find it interesting, too, whoever you are. We now know that devils do not cause illnesses, right? Now, it's 2020 right now. I don't know when you're going to be watching this video. It's 2020. And we, we global citizens are living through the COVID-19 pandemic. I don't think anyone, religious or not, believes that COVID-19 was created by a demon or a devil? I don't think. I mean, I haven't read that. I, I, you know, I could be mistaken. Maybe somebody does. But we now know that angels do not heal the sick. So if somebody recovers from COVID-19, that's not by the grace of an angel. I, maybe there are people who believe that, and that's fine. I'm not even criticizing that. Um, but generally, we do not believe that demons imprecate humanity by diffusing plagues, pandemics, and epidemics throughout the world, like COVID-19. But there was a time when such things were believed, not about COVID-19, but about plagues. There was a time when people believed that devils caused plagues. But what is that? But imaginary causality, imaginary causation, right? There was a time when, and this is 
I mean, this is fascinating to me. There was a time when people believed that meat give, let me say that again. There was a time when people believed that meat gave birth to maggots. Maggots emerge from meat that is left out in the sun. No, this, uh, this of course is a, a kind of confusion of cause and effect. There was a time when people believed that grain gave birth to mice. This is another confusion of cause and effect. There was a time when people thought that certain babies were evil. I don't believe that, don't blame me, but people used to believe that. They also believed that evil babies came from incubi. Incubi is the plural of, of incubus, an evil spirit. The mother made it perhaps unknowingly with an incubus in mind, an incubus who crawled into her bed at night. And the products of such an unholy union were called cambions. It's a fascinating word, cambions. A cambion is a half human, half demonic offspring, a kind of hybrid offspring between human and uh, incubus. Anyway, let's go over this. So imaginary causality works in this fashion, excuse me. This is how imaginary causation works. A phenomenon is experienced and then an imaginary cause is super added after the fact. So there's a chimerical cause. A chimerical cause is chimerized where a natural explanation would do much better. Instead of applying Occam's razor, right, you know, the simplest natural explanation is probably the right one. One introjects an imaginary cause into a natural process, right? Okay, so let's go back to the meat example. Flies. Flies are attracted to rotting meat. Flies are attracted to meat left out in the sun. And they lay their eggs on the meat to which they are attracted. And the larval stage of a fly is a maggot, right? Let's go back to the mice and the grain example. So mice are attracted to the grain in the barn. And the farmer sees a mischief of mice. Mischief is, is a group of mice is called a mischief of mice. So the farmer sees a mischief of mice in his barn or her barn and assumes erroneously that the grain gave birth to the mice. A child is born and the child is difficult. I don't know why. Uh, unmanageable, unruly. And the father believes falsely that his wife coupled with an incubus. All of this is nonsense. It's superstitious nonsense. But that's not the point. The point is, this is the fruit of imaginary causation. Now, this false logic might even take the form of the confusion of chronology with causality. So uh, let's say I went to a Japanese restaurant last night. And I woke up this morning sick. And then I falsely assume, maybe not falsely, but I assume that I got sick because of the food that I ate last night. Well, maybe, maybe this might be the case, but it's not necessarily the case. Or think of some creepy person who leaves an insulting comment on someone's YouTube channel. And then the next day, the YouTuber deletes her channel. And then the creep thinks, oh, I got her to delete her channel. Maybe, but there's no immediate evidence that would support that assertion. This is called, I'm sure many of you know this, post hoc ergo propter hoc. After this, therefore, because of this. And again, it's a confusion of chronology with causality. Simply because something happens first, this does not mean that it is the cause of something else, right? Anyway, to get back to Nietzsche more immediately, this is all about Nietzsche. I'm just, I'm just interpreting. But, 
Uh, morality is based on imaginary qualities or causes as well, such as human responsibility or the free will to which I will presently return. There's a great deal of talk in this culture about whether or not it is necessary to believe in God in order to be a moral person. But we don't need to go that far. We don't need to go that far. I mean, there's the theodical cliche. Theodical means re referring to theodicy, right? The idea of justifying, um, how do you reconcile the idea of a beneficent God with a world that is overflowing with misery, right? Theodicy means theos, God, DK means justice. How do you justify the existence of a benevolent, beneficent God in a world that is overflowing with misery? Well, we don't need to go that far. We don't need to go that far. I'll explain what I mean because morality, classical morality is fraught with imaginary causalities and imaginary qualities. Atheists have the tendency to attack theists for believing in an intervening God, but that seems, that seems hypocritical to me. Although Nietzsche says that there are no hip, hip excuse me, there are no hypocrites anymore, that, that contemporary Germans at least don't have the strength for hypocrisy. I'm not gonna get into that just yet, but. So many of the godless seem to believe in the imaginary. Isn't that interesting? Consider the imaginary presuppositions of traditional classical morality. You might not know what I mean. I'll explain. Traditional morality, even without religion, is based on the imaginary, including atheistic morality. It's based on the imaginary already. There are a number of very famous atheists who seem very, very religious to me. I won't name them. For these atheistic public intellectuals believe in imaginary causes. They believe in imaginary causes such as moral responsibility and the free will. It has never been proven that any human being is essentially, essentially morally responsible. Now, one might say that being more morally responsible has its benefits. One might say that one should be morally responsible. I agree with those things. I agree with those statements. But isn't that another question? I'm talking about moral responsibility as something supernatural. Now, if, if someone believes in moral responsibility, that person does believe in imaginary causation. Now, that's fine, but to use a cliche, uh, to use slang, own it, <laughs> own it. Um, it is very likely that such a person believes that morality is universal as well, which it is not. Now, I've expanded on this subject elsewhere. But let me say a few words to refute the fallacious claim that morality is universal. It's not. Anyone who believes that morality is universal is ignoring the historical fact that marriage, for example, was at one time regarded as something almost criminal. I know it sounds crazy today, but marriage was once regarded as something transgressive because well, not to get too deep into this, but marriage was thought of as a private relationship. And if you have a private relationship, you are, um, let me just say, flouting the authority of the feudal lord. What about hubris, right? We all know hubris. Hubris was regarded as a transgression, as a kind of crime against the divine. A crime against the divine in ancient Greece. Consider the myth of Prometheus, right? Prometheus stole fire from the gods, from the Olympian gods. And what was his punishment? To be shackled to a wall. And every day, an eagle, I believe it was an eagle, maybe a vulture, I'll just say an eagle. An eagle swooped down and devoured his liver only to have the liver regrow 
and then be redevoured again the next day, the next day by the eagle. So I'm trying to say that in ancient Greece, any violation of nature, and listen, the gods were emblematical of nature in ancient Greece, in the mythology of ancient Greece, was seen as a transgression. But look at the violation of nature that happens right around here and throughout North America. What about the violation of nature, which is mountaintop blasting, mountaintop mining? What about that? That's a violation of nature. Oh, most people don't have a problem with that. Some do. Some do, those who are environmentalists or sustainably minded, they do. But I would, I mean, this is a norm. This practice of mountaintop removal, mountaintop blasting is a norm. It's a practice which is a norm. So no one can tell me that it isn't, um, no one can tell me that mountaintop removal is seen as a transgression in American culture, because it isn't. If it were, it wouldn't happen. Or it would be disapproved of and not practiced so widely in our societies. Revenge. This might come as a surprise, but revenge was once considered a virtue in ancient Greece. Read the Oresteia of Aeschylus. But today we disprove of it, right? I mean, I don't, I mean, generally, I mean, I know there are films like Quentin Tarantino films that praise revenge, sure. But I mean, revenge is not a cultural value in this culture. Does anyone think of it as a value? Let me pause there. Welcome back, my friends. Let's talk about idol four. So the fourth idol, which is toppled from its pedestal, is the argumentum ad consequentium. Although Nietzsche doesn't actually use this Latin phrase, it's the argument from consequence. Um, the argumentum ad consequentium is a logical fallacy. So let's say that I believe with every fiber of my being, that I will be revived after my death as a hammerhead shark, or maybe an Ashira cat, or an Egyptian wolverine, right? Let's say it gives me pleasure to believe this. Let's say that I need to believe this in order to maintain my sense of well-being. So what? Pleasure proves nothing. The pleasure produced by an idea proves absolutely nothing about the soundness of that idea. Now, Nietzsche makes the point that hope ferments comfort. He doesn't use the word ferment, but get it. It could just as easily be argued that hope ferments discomfort, I would say. But anyway, anyway, fine. Um, irenicism, right? Irenicism might bring me comfort. I might desire with my entire being for there to be an irenic future, right? That doesn't mean that I can look forward to the prospect of an irenic peaceful future. It doesn't mean anything. It is impossible to make absolute statements about the future with any degree of justification. And the future doesn't care about me and my, and in my emotional state. So just because I want to believe that the future will be irenic, that doesn't mean that it will be ironic. Just because I desire a comforting cause, this doesn't necessarily imply that the ostensible cause is the cause, right? So anyway, Nietzsche makes short work of that. Now the fifth mythology is already one of the best refuted mythologies in existence. It's voluntarism. Nietzsche doesn't use that term. Voluntarism, though, is the doctrine of the freedom of the will, right? The mythology of the freedom of the will. Nietzsche doesn't actually demolish the concept of the freedom of the will in this book, though. He doesn't. What he does is more interesting. He, he, he already annihilated the concept of the freedom of the will, this factitious concept 
in other of his books, for example, Menschliches uh, Alter Menschliches, Human Alter Human, Jenseits von Gut und Böse, Beyond Good and Evil. He's already demolished the concept of the freedom of the will. And he's even demolished the concept of the unfreedom of the will or the unwill in Beyond Good and Evil. But and he returns to that here. But anyway, I digress. I do. I digress. What I'm trying to say, though, is Nietzsche is wondering instead in this book. Instead, Nietzsche is wondering, what is the benefit of having other people believe in the freedom of the will? Qui bono? Qui bono? Who benefits? Who benefits from believing in the freedom of the will? Who benefits from making others believe in the freedom of the will? This is the argument, and it is an interesting one. Um, those who are invested in the propagation of the doctrine of free will theory are practicing a form of sadism. And I'm going to read a little bit. Um, this is on page 181 of the English translation. Let me read a little bit. Whenever a particular state of affairs is traced back to a will, an intention, or a responsible action, becoming is stripped of its innocence. The notion of will was essentially designed with punishment in mind, which is to say the desire to assign guilt. Assign guilt is in italics. The whole of ancient psychology, the psychology of will, was conditioned by the desire of its architects, the priests at the head of the ancient community, to establish their right to inflict punishment or to assign their right to God. I want to read this in the German for my German listeners. It will just take me a moment. This is on page 95 of the German. And this is paragraph seven of Die Vier Großen Irrtümer. Okay. Überall, wo Verantwortlichkeiten gesucht werden, pflegt es der Instinkt des Strafen, unrichten Wollens zu sein, der da sucht. Man hat das Werden seiner Unschuld entkleidet, wenn irgendein so und so sein Aufwille auf Absichten, auf Achte der Verantwortlichkeit zurückgeführt wird. Die Lehre vom Willen ist wesentlich erfunden, erfunden zum Zweck der Strafe. Right? Das heißt, des schuldig finden Wollens. Die ganze alte, die ganze alte Psychologie, die Willenspsychologie hat ihre Voraussetzung darin, dass deren Urheber, die Priester, an der Spitze alter Gemeinwesen Sieg ein Recht schaffen wollen, Strafen zu verhängen oder Gott dazu ein Recht schaffen wollten. So there you have it, translation. And this is not a, I mean, not a translation, but I guess a commentary, a paraphrase. There must be a free will because I have the emotional need to believe in the free will. So this is another version of the argumentum ad consequentium, but there is a specific emotional need at play here. Let's talk about that. Here is another paraphrase, which gets into the specific emotional need that is being activated here. There must be a free will because I want to punish people. Maybe even I want to punish myself, but that's not really what Nietzsche is writing about here. There must be a free will because I want to punish people. And I cannot punish them. I cannot do so by inflicting them with guilt unless they believe that they are free to choose otherwise. Uh, unless they are free to believe that they are, they are free to choose whatever they choose. In other words, People must believe in the free will in order for the ruling class, the priestly 
caste and class to punish them. That's the legitimacy. That's the justification of punishment, right? Belief in the free will. I mean, if you consider this, there was even a court case in the United States, a Supreme Court case about this. It was the Grayson case, right? Um, the Supreme Court declared that one must not remove the cornerstone of the criminal justice system in America, the theoretical cornerstone, is belief in the freedom of the will. And any um, removal of the doctrine of the freedom of the will is really an erosion of the criminal justice system in America. So the whole criminal justice system is built on the, the concept of the free will. Now, we were taught in on the genealogy of morality, zur genealogie der Moral, that all human beings are cruel, right? This is something that Nietzsche writes in essay two of on the genealogy of morality, that all human beings are cruel. But some of us interiorize our impulse toward cruelty. Now, when cruelty is reintrojected into the human self, that is called guilt and the bad conscience. Again, you can read about this in essay two of on the genealogy of morality, or you can you can watch and listen to my video on the subject. And the inculcation of guilt actively negates my self-esteem, my feeling of self-worth. But all human beings are cruel, according to Nietzsche. They're, they're all cruel. Um, nothing is more natural to the human animal than a taste for cruelty. And it might take the form of, you know, watching tragic spectacles, watching films with cruelty, horror films. Though Nietzsche, you know, we're watching these, these god-awful YouTube videos in which people make mistakes, you know. Everybody knows what schadenfreude is. Though Nietzsche never actually writes about sociopathy, this idea made me rethink uh, modern psychology's take on sociopathy. Perhaps it is inaccurate to throw certain people into a bucket labeled sociopaths, right? Perhaps there is a kind of economy of sociopathy. Perhaps everyone, in other words, has the capacity for sociopathy. What do I mean by this? If I'm wrong about this, why do so many people enjoy violent sports such as boxing or toromachi? Toromachi just means bullfighting, right? Why? Is there a certain moment in which any human being can read about the destruction of other human beings with coldness, with indifference? All right, let me pause for just a moment and then we will talk about the sixth and final idol to be devastated. The sixth and final idol is the idea that life has some transcendent purpose, which it does not, according to Nietzsche. Another one of the most famous statements um, ever made by Nietzsche also appears in this book. This, is, this book is chock-a-block with famous statements. Um, this appears all over social media, and this is aphorism 12 of the book. Let me actually quote it in English, and then I'll quote it in German. So in English, it is, if someone has a why in life, if someone has a why in life, one can get along with almost any how. And this is, again, this is aphorism 12. Hat man sein Warum des Lebens, so verträgt man sich fast mit jedem wie. If someone has a why in life, one can get along with almost any how. Okay, fine. However, this aphorism has been too often misinterpreted. Nietzsche is suggesting that the idea of a purpose in life makes life tolerable, to be sure, but he is not suggesting that life actually has a real transcendent purpose, not at all. Life has no purpose at all, according to Nietzsche. Life has no purpose at all. As I wrote in my essay on human all too human, all is purposeless yet necessary. 
So life does not move in the direction of some transcendent goal unless death and decomposition would be considered as goals. But nonetheless, everyone is necessary. Everyone is necessary in relation to the whole economy of life. Everyone is necessary in relation to the whole economy of life. There is an amazing profusion of human types in the economy of life. And one should never wish to wish away any human being, for each human being, again, is necessary for the operation and self-maintenance of the entire economy of the human species. Every mediocrity is essential to the economy of life. Every mediocrity. Uh, without the mediocre, the remarkable would be unremarkable. Bad books are essential because they are consonant with the tastes of undiscerning people, right? Bad books are necessary. I'm sorry, I, I made a mistake. There's actually yet another ideal. I forgot about this one. The seventh idol is the idea that humanity is progressively improving, which it manifestly is not. And it is refreshing to read Nietzsche's counter argument to the Enlightenment. Now, you might wonder what I'm talking about. Well, the Enlightenment, the Aufklärung, especially the European Enlightenment, well, I mean, God, I mean, this is the Enlightenment hypothesis par excellence, other than the, you know, the Kantian Enlightenment hypothesis, I'm sorry, let me get to the main point. So the Enlightenment hypothesis is that humanity is gradually refining itself. And, and no, I take that back. You can actually find this in, in Kant. Die Beantwortung der Frage, was ist Aufklärung? I think that's the title. Um, answer to the question, what is enlightenment? Also, read Lessing. Read Lessing. The Education of the Human Race. Die Erziehung des Menschengeschlechts. Um, but if you read Kant's What is Enlightenment, answer to the question, what is enlightenment, and Lessing's education of the human race, I think you'll agree with me that the enlightenment was primarily, like the fundamental core belief of the enlightenment is that humanity can and is improving, can improve and is improving. Anyway, I already discussed Nietzsche's diagnosis of modernity in my lecture series on Beyond Good and Evil, and you might know that in a nutshell, Nietzsche's diagnosis of modernity is that modernity is suffering from a paralysis of the will. But Nietzsche also writes about the mediocritization of humanity in the modern world, the idiotization of humanity in the modern world, um, the stupidification of human beings in the modern world. Sure, the banalization of human beings in the modern world. But in um, Gutzendemmerl, or the man mit dem hammer philosophy in Twilight of the Idols, or how to how to philosophize with a hammer. Nietzsche has a slightly different critique of modernity. In modernity, according to the logic of this book, progression and regression are one and the same. The ostensible refining of humankind is really a kind of taming, a domesticating, a baiting. B a t i n g a making docile of the human beast, right? Well, we train animals. Animals are trained, right? This doesn't mean that they're becoming more sophisticated, right? Why do we say that about human beings? Neither, neither is it the case that the human beast becomes sophisticated, becomes refined, simply because it is trained to be civilized, in quotation marks. I think about the David Lynch film, from 1980, The Elephant Man. If you haven't seen it, see it. But um, I mean, David Lynch's film, I think intuitively, unconsciously, makes the argument that making civilized is retrogressive. It's a retrogressive step. It is the manipulation and the curtailing of the life instincts. Then again, David Lynch's Elephant Man, in many ways, is. Um, a reinterpretation of the Tarzan myth, 
Edgar Rice Burroughs and Greystoke and all of that. But I, I digress. But anyway, making civilized again is retrogressive. It's a retrogressive step. It is the manipulation or the curtailing of the life instincts. An uncaged animal is more advanced than the modern human being, right? And Nietzsche is in good company when he believes this. Kafka said something quite similar to Gustav Januk, allegedly. I believe that he did. Um, Kafka said to, to Januk, in the light of Darwinism, human evolution looks like a monkey's fall from grace. H.L. Mencken wrote something quite similar, but I can't find the quotation right now. But Mencken, you know, he, he was essentially saying that the human being, um, he, he was essentially saying that human beings are a fall from grace, right? That humankind is a kind of devolution, a de-evolution. Uh, Mencken, of course, was simply inverting the common misconception of Darwinian evolution, that human beings evolved from apes, which they did not. And Mencken made fun of this idea in, in other of his writings. Mencken covered the Scopes trial, but, but Mencken's idea was that um, the ape is at a much higher level evolutionarily than the human animal. And he's probably right. So as I've said above, Nietzsche is an antinomian, right? He reminds us again and again not to believe in any traditional concept that you have not tested yourself. Don't believe in a concept simply because it's transition, simply because it's traditional. Don't believe in any concept that you've not evaluated yourself. It makes no sense to believe in a concept merely because it is old. To do so is to enter the logical fallacy known as argumentum ad antiquatum, the argument from tradition. Simply because an idea is horribly old, that does not imply that that idea is valid. Permit me to enumerate all of the ideals that are detonated in this book all of the idols that are twilight. So false idol number one, I know this is very schematic, but whatever. False idol one is the idea that reason leads to virtue and virtue leads to happiness. Reason leads to virtue, which leads to happiness. False idol two, absolutes exist. There is such a thing as an absolute motionless, changeless being, whether it is the self, whether it is permanency, an unconditional origin, absolute finality, a signified meaning that would come before language, etc. False idol three, imaginary causes are real causes, they are not. False idol four, a belief that gives me pleasure is a true belief. False idol five, there exists something like a free will. There's no such thing. False idol six, life has a transcendent purpose. And false idol seven, humanity is progressively improving. Thank you very much. This is the end of my video on, once more, Götzendämmerung. Oder wie man mit dem Hammer philosophiert, Twilight of the Idols, or how to Philosophize with a Hammer by Friedrich Nietzsche. My name is Joseph Sulia. Once more, S-U-G-L-I-A is how one spells my surname. Thank you very much. The next video series that I will be creating will concern Shakespeare's Symboline. Thank you very much. I am Joseph Sulia signing out and signing off. I will see you in the next one, or you will see me. I won't see you, but you will see me.